Pepeta, welcome. Okay, thank you, thank you, Beata. Uh, thank you to everybody to to be present in this uh, uh, in this uh, first le lecture. I will have uh, two two lectures in two in two weeks, and the f this first lecture is organized uh, is a a kind of uh, approaching about the 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 product uh, the product design uh, with the, with the new with new new approaches. I will try to to have a kind of work through the methods and the, the approaches uh, arriving to to the design for all approach and so you can go with the with the the, the first the first slide better thank you so uh, we all recognize this man it is to him that we have one of the most important insights of modern science in fact, when Charles Darwin is in uh, in uh, 1859 published his theory of evolution of the species, he shocked not only the world of science but also the common way of thinking. He, in his work, he proposed a, revolu a revolutionary explanation for the time of a phenomenon that had always attracted the attention of scholars. That is the enormous variety of forms of living organisms. And uh, also the chart, the church judged him, uh, as you know, blasphemous, because in Darwin's vision, uh, man is no longer at the apex, at the top of the divi divine creation, but he is uh, the result of a long process of natural selection, like all other organisms. Darwin's uh, reasoning is based on the principle that uh, in the struggle for existence, the fittest uh, survive. That is, uh, the individuals whose characters are most advantageous are uh, the best to, to survive. And uh, all the others don't survive, don't survive um, as nature because of scarce of food, adver adverse climate, predators, etc., operates a natural selection. So, progress uh, is another thing. Uh, the title of this slide is Evolution Progress. Evolution is what uh, Darwin uh, says, but progress is another thing. Um, progress concerns with social context and therefore um, is governed by other principles. Can you uh, go to the, to the following? Thank you. And so, um, um, here is a, a a sentence from uh, George Bernachot in 1905 uh, in the comedy Man and Superman, he writes that the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. And uh, George Bernachot therefore re reinterpret Darwin's theory from a different point of view effectively contrasting evolution with progress. The first depends on adaptation and the second on the opposite uh, side, on the opposite attitude, is an attitude of contrast with respect of uh, unfo unfo unfor um, unforable conditions. And so can you go to the, the following? And so what is our idea of progress? Uh, the definition uh, you see in the, in, the, in the slide is given from the Treccani Encyclopedia, is one of the most important encyclopedia in Italy. And uh, in the, the definition is uh, uh, that progress is a, a vertical advancement towards higher degrees of stages with implicit therefore the concept of improvement, of evolution, a, a gradual and continuous transformation from good to better, both in a limited context and in a broader and more total sense. Here we, we speak of improvement, of evolution, of transformation from good to better. But do what do we, we mean by good to better? So you can go to the following. And so I try to start from another point. Um, the birth of design if we can speak of birth, uh, goes back to the same years as Darwin theory. In um, it is uh, 1851, so the, the same years, 
we are in London and the event that you can see is uh, the great, great exhibition. It is the first major universal exhibition, which uh, on the one hand marks the birth of the modern globalization of markets, and on the other hand, the birth of mass production of consumer goods. In those years, the concept of serial production of standardization became strategic for the burning modern economy. So, in the following, next, next, and so, um, with a with a, a step forward uh, this slide takes us uh, at least six no no the, the former one uh, at least six uh, no uh, the former the previous uh, uh, in fact the, this uh, this slide takes us uh, at least six years forward compared to the the great exhibition and the uh, year uh, the serial production process has already, always already has already reached its complete maturity. Everyone on, on the right uh, recognized the legendary 40 uh, that was produced from 1980 to 1927 uh, in 50 million of units through the introduction of the assembly line, which reduced the, the assembly time of a, of a car uh, in uh, one hour and a half. And the cost from 1815, no, $850, $850 in, uh, in the beginning in 1980 to, to $260, $270 in 1927. So the price was, uh, was uh, reduced a lot. The image on the left, uh, taken from Chaplin's Modern Times from 19. Uh, 36 already highlights the other side of the coin of the globalization of ma uh, and of mass production of uh, products. The inhumanity of factory work uh, all aimed uh, at reducing time and cost to the at disadvantage of the workers. workers. The works were, were, uh, were considered as tools for the, the factories. Uh, they, so they, they were really work, uh, uh, were treated as uh, mere tools. So now the following slide. Um, as uh, it has been said uh, before, another aspect linked to the industrial production uh, in which we have to reflect on, which begins uh, with a very bit of design, is certainly the search for the standard that mass production is taken to its extreme uh, consequences. Um, not that they had uh, never spoken about standardization in previous centuries. We all recognize the icon uh, on the left, uh, which also embodies the humanist spirit of the centrality of man in the universe, taken as a model, a measure of all things. It was a... Uh, uh, theorized by Vitruvio and was taken again uh, from Leonardo da Vinci. But uh, certainly the 20th century is uh, the center of the search for the standard, aimed at the production of goods suitable for everyone, of which we know that Le Corbusier Modulor represents the, the, the new manifesto. Le Corbusier, we know that Le Corbusier, uh, with the, all his measures, uh, re re reproducing in the modular design everything from the from the stand, standard uh, the furniture you can see in the, uh, in the center of the screen till to the architecture till to the uh, urban planning and so um, everything was standardized standardized in uh, specific uh, measures about men so you can go in the following next slide this slide, uh, with this slide, I try to outline the transformation of consumer goods that took place just uh, under a century with the Industrial Revolution. Um, above is uh, shown the unitary process, what is called the unitary process, uh, the one in which the craftsman, who is uh, this, both designer and producer, 
creates products that are often often uh, tailored for those who have to all, to use them. Below uh, is uh, that is called the frag fragmented process of industrial production. In it, the development phases of a product are fragmented, are split over time in places and by different figures. There is somebody who design products, somebody somebody who produce them, and some uh, and somebody who uses them. And it is precisely in the transition from the top to the bottom of this slide uh, that is uh, from the end made production to the industrial production that the lack of a discipline of connection between the different actors uh, and their skills begins to be uh, felt. So go to the next slide. These are just the years in which a new discipline was developed. developed. It was 1949, precisely uh, on July 8th, during a business meeting in a room. Uh, we know also the number of the room. It is a one uh, 11 and 1 room of the British, British Admiralty at the Queen Anne's Mansion in Oxford, when Professor uh, Marrell supposed the birth of a new discipline able to adapt work to man and uh, he called this discipline ergonomics it is uh, the starting moment of the development of the international scientific community made up of very different professionals they, there are doctors uh, psychologists anthropologists statistics statisticians designers engineers and so on and uh, among the primary roles of ergonomics especially ergonomics applied to design, there is certainly that of coordinating and providing specialist knowledge and notions to designers of products, services and environments, referring primarily to those who will be the end users. Uh, the ergonomics act like a, an orchestra conductor uh, who manages uh, tries to coordinate the knowledge and skills that are sometimes very distant from each other to obtain information that is uh, enough general to be able to to justify serious production and uh, at the same time enough specific to adapt the needs expressed by users who are divided into homogeneous groups of, uh, of people but uh, these as you can, ima can imagine, could also determine um, effects that are not, are not always uh, positive, such as uh, those uh, indicated in the title of this slide, that is the fragmentation of knowledge and competencies. I mean, I mean that with the, the start of, uh, of ergonomic, the, the ergonomic discipline, uh, all the knowledge about people, about, uh, about uh, individuals, becomes to be really fragmented also in the in the under the design point of view and so next slide before going forward is better to define try to define ergonomics what is it how can we briefly define it i often use the the the, the diagram you can see in the center of the slide where there is a man tools, tasks, and uh, environments. Um, we can say that ergonomics deals with the man that is in the center, who uses certain tools while performing specific tasks within certain environments. And you can read it uh, as, uh, as you, you want. You can see also it uh, deals with men uh, we, while using uh, specific, uh, uh, while in, in specific environments, uh, using specific tools, uh, uh, performing specific tasks. So in the slide you can see in the, in the left and the right uh, two, two images. In fact, in the, in the left, there is an Im image of a manual, ergonomic manual that is a, especially, uh, it is a, about a, a anthropometric manual. The manuals uh, don't, we know that the manuals don't reflect the complexity of the factors that uh, determine the condition of well-being 
in the use uh, of environments, objects or systems. We get just some base, ba basic information that are uh, certainly uh, useful, but are not the, the only one. In fact, ergonomic is about knowing uh, the needs uh, dictated by the tasks, uh, the people, the, the context, uh, the organizations, and uh, the manual, uh, I underline that the manual gives the, the basic data very well, valid for a generality of a homogeneous situation, but uh, not all the situations are homogeneous as, you, as we know. In fact, they don't satisfy the in-depth ones uh, because situation, situa situations are never homogeneous, but they, they are always different. Uh, also, people are always different, as, as we know. In the, in the next slide, um, the object we see in the center of the slide, which is uh, considered a design icon, was designed by Charles Sims, as you can read in the slide in 1949, seems to be designed on different postural hypotheses and at the same time inspires numerous ways of use. So we, we can say that it is a, a good example of a, a product design because it, it deals with the different way to, to sit, to, to stay uh, in relax uh, from, from people. In the next slide, there is a, a, another interesting reflection about this, this kind of issue. Um, in fact, the, the, convenience and the convenience and the easy of use of products um, has therefore always been at the center of ergonomic interests. Almost 40 years ago, <clears throat> the Italian <coughs> semiologist Umberto Eco uh, wrote uh, about the communicative dimension of design, this uh, interesting uh, 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 sentence, sentences. He says that the object must, all, all must also show what it is for and how it should be used. In short, there is a communicative aspect of the object, which is part of its design. A perfect, a perfect example is given by Schissors. Their shape indicates, even to those who have never seen them, where the fingers must be inserted to make them work. Scissors as are a design masterpiece. They not only cut, but they tell how they should be handled. This aspect of the design is fundamental, but it is not always taken into consideration. Indeed, it must be recognized that often unconscious and while design is much wiser, than sign a design where for aesthetic in brackets needs uh, new forms are often uh, invented that say nothing to those who must use the, the object. Paradoxically, in order to create functional objects, the designers try to accentuate, accentuate the communicative functions of these objects and instead of producing objects that communicated the way they could uh, be used, they produce the object they communicate the philosophy of design. That is the object, uh, that is, the object did not say I can be used like this and like this, but rather said I'm a perfect design object. Umberto Eco, 1982. Um, this opened to, yeah, no, to the second, to the following slide, to um, the development in the last years of ergonomics. Uh, this is why, in fact, uh, um, this is why over time ergonomics applied to design um, uh, have developed specific and articulated methodolo methodologies, techniques and tools to intercept the needs of specific groups of users in a, an increasing uh, uh, targeted manner. User-centered design, so it's called, through product uh, usability evolution tests, made it possible to attribute a strategic role to the contribution that ergonomics can give to the success of a product and uh, with it obviously uh, of a company. 
this is a, a typical example in which uh, the, the one in the, in the slide in which uh, Heinz has just overturned the package of ketchup simply by observing its use when ketchup has to be poured in the somewhere in the in your plates. And then the following. And then there are the the same paradoxes too. Uh, this is not a product of use, obviously. It is, a, we, I, I consider it a, a paradoxical object that uh, I say, unfortunately, has become a design icon of the last 30 years, in a certain sense, uh, distorting the primary, the primary value of an everyday object, which in fact must first of all be used, not be seen uh, and, 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 and all. Philip Starr's uh, uh, citrus juicer, juicer is probably the negation of easy of use and efficiency. It's hard, very hard to squeeze anything out of it, but it uh, is indicated by many as an example of design. And why this happens? Uh, the next slide. Yeah, probably because uh, the design also has an evocative and emotional dimension, which leads us to choose some products instead of others for reasons related to factors other than those of pure functionality. A pleasantness uh, that derives from the satisfaction of aesthetic taste in turn uh, once connected to fashion and to a certain style. And so, the next one. For this reason, in the last 20 years, ergonomics has also developed specific tools to evaluate and design ple uh, pleasant products in relation to a specific theoretical structure, the so-called uh, uh, structure of the four pleasures. Um, this is uh, how we talk uh, about physio, psycho, social and ideal pleasure. The, the next one. So we have a uh, physio pleasure. Um, it is uh, the pleasure that comes from the sense organs, touch, sight, smell, hearing, taste. It uh, derives from the sensation experienced when using a product. Then we have uh, the psycho pleasure. It is a pleasure that concerns with the cognitive load necessary in using a product or, ser or, or a service and the emotional reaction caused by it. Then we have a social pleasure. It is the pleasure that comes from relationships with others, from belonging, to, for example, to a social group when it uh, reflects oneself in uh, one's statu status. And then, then we have an ideal pleasure. That is the pleasure that comes from the satisfaction of uh, aesthetic tastes, values such as philosophical, ethical, religious, political values, and the uh, aspirations. And so, next one. In any case, uh, all these, however, has uh, had uh, consequences over time, which I try to summarize through a couple of points, which uh, asks for a specific reflection. The first one is, uh, as I have already told before, the multiplicity of knowledge involves, in, involved in ergonomics, um, that was the initial strength of the discipline, has gradually uh, transformed into a complex fragmentation of skills, which risked to lose the sight of the starting individual's holistic vision. <clears throat> and the second point is uh, the very idea of progress of society from which we start and which gave rise to the need for discipline with uh, the characteristics, with the features we have described uh, so far, has proved itself in the long run to, to be a problem, or at least to be no longer able to intercept some new paradigms of contemporary society. So let's see why, starting from this second point, go to the next one. In fact, in the contemporary globalized scenario, uh, new demographic paradigms are emerging, constantly growing, with which we must necessarily have, a, have to deal. Among these uh, are the aging, 
of the population and the multi multiculturalism of society. These are phenomena that have been that have been or will certainly be described in depth in other lectures. Uh, or this, uh, or this uh, I, I think I, I saw before Pete uh, Kercher, I, I'm sure that he, he dealt about this and uh, on which therefore I will not dwell. Uh, however, there are uh, these two are the starting point for two further reflection. That is in the next next slide. In fact, when uh, we what is necessary to underline here is that uh, traditional ergonomics, we can call it uh, uh, like a traditional ergonomics, has always continued to bring with it uh, some limits. First of all, the limit refer to the average or standard users, even if working on specifically segmented and uh, defined groups. The reference of ergonomics is often to mature, healthy, perfectly capable, and totally lucid individuals, attentive and informed in every occasion and context of life. Uh, one student last, last week told me uh, that he, he know just one man with these characteristic, characteristics, and uh, his name is uh, James Bond. So he was, he was uh, just a joke. Um, the consequence of this is uh, that on the on the one hand, uh, to attribute any difficulties, errors, or accident that may occur in the use of products, services, or systems or environments, they are always attributed to the incompetence of the users. Who is who is wrong? Or on the other hand, uh, to further we look for further segmentation of users towards increasingly specific and marginal groups. So on the one end, we, we think to human error, and on the other side, we think to try to uh, design products for specific and more, more and more specific users. And so, next one. Therefore, um, new design questions necessarily arise at this point, but which uh, in reality underlie deeper questions linked to the desiderable model of social development. That is, uh, it is appropriate to continue to pursue uniformity of cultures, behaviors, contexts, or to enhance the inevitably present diversity of, of uh, uh, contemporary times. And it's better to standardize, standardize or diversify the design response. And therefore, are exclusive, are exclusive products desirable, or it is better to pursue the inclusiveness of products? Obviously, these are rhetorical questions, which all also open up to a subsequent reasoning connected to the fragmentation of the discipline that I mentioned before. The following one. And this point requires a, a broader observation point. In fact, the idea of, of uh, an indispensable, inevitable and continuous economic growth still linked to the development logics of the industrial societies of the last century is incompatible with the concept of limited resources of our planet and with the concepts of social equity and the environmental balance on the scale at the scale of global markets. Thus, uh, the issue, the theme of uh, the unsustainability of the current model of development of contemporary societies entered the agendas of world politics and economy. And so, next one. So, in a, in a new vision of transition to sustainability, it would therefore be better to favor a transdisciplinary approach for ergonomics, to put at the center of its interest man and his context in their totality and uh, diversity. This would be the true holistic approach to ergonomic design, living in the, in the past, the traditional ergonomic which consists of um, the principle uh, according to which the functional sum of the parts 
of an, an organism or a, a group is always greater, bigger than the sum of the performances of the parts taken in the individually. This is the, the just the definition of a holistic, holistic. And the first uh, who probably proposed to apply this holistic approach to ergonomics, to ergonomic design was uh, Luigi Bandini Buti, our Italian mentor, who already 15 years ago, 15, 16 years ago, was the first to theorize the development of a so-called holistic ergonomics and not uh, tradi traditional ergonomics. What does uh, this mean uh, in practice? It means, uh, for example, to consider human diversity as a value, to consider the individual as a complex organism and at the same time part of a complex and nuanced uh, society. This means uh, opening up the ergonomic disciplines towards more innovative design principles and approaches. Those that we call the design for inclusion approaches. And so go to the following. And this slide, maybe uh, several of you already know these, uh, these, uh, these sketches. This slide clarifies uh, the differences between exclusion, segregation, integration, and inclusion of individuals with respect to a social context. Social inclusion, with, uh, which is represented in the last diagram on the right, assumes uh, um, is uh, the active, comfortable, and pleasant participation in daily work, social, and playful activities by everyone. The design for inclusion is often confused with the design for disability. The design for disability, if uh, conducted with a strict focus on disabilities, often runs uh, the risk of excluding or segregating, as uh, it is represented in the second diagram, rather than including people with disabilities in the in the in the society i try with a with a just with a couple of slides uh, to better clarify this aspect which is fundamental for those involved in the for inclusion and so go to the the following one these products are products for blind people as uh, it is evident there isn't any favor to color and they also refer exclusively to the braille system known almost exclusively from blind people the result what is the result the result is that uh, these products are produced by, for blind people only blind persons only in a certain sense marginalizing their use and therefore glittering greatly greatly uh, lim limiting uh, their potential markets because they are just for a, a small part of our society. Next one. And these, on the other end, are two products developed also for blind people, not, not only for blind people. I think that the one on the left is known to everyone. It is the iWatch, the Apple smartwatch. Now it uh, arrives to the seventh, uh, I think, to the seventh uh, generation. Uh, the Apple smartwatch that integrates a voiceover system that allows you to overcome visual impairments. And the one on the right is the i1, the wristwatch from Bradley, that is promoted by the company with these words that you can write, uh, can uh, see in, in, the, in the site. A modern watch that more people <coughs> can use and in more ways, designed for touch when you can't easily use the site, during a meeting, in a movie theater, or due to a vision environment, but not only for, for that. As we know, the number of people with specific sensory, motor, or, co or cognitive difficulties is cons constantly growing, together with their desire for emancipation and the awareness of want wanting and being able uh, to be autonomous in daily activities. People with disabilities certainly express specific needs, especially in relation to special aids and processes. But uh, for the rest, uh, for the rest, a holistic view of the design teams uh, is appropriate. Because a product in order to be inclusive must also be beautiful. That is, uh, like the others, it must, must satisfy the pleasures 
uh, we talked about uh, earlier. And so, fortunately, uh, and here, fortunately, uh, various approaches to design for inclusion have, have been developed over the last 30 years from the United States to the, uh, the, to the United Kingdom to purely European context, they all have a common goal, which is to include, uh, we know uh, a, a lot of things about universal design, for example, from the, uh, for the US, uh, USA, or inclusive design, mostly from the United Kingdom. Among all the, the different approaches, I think it's my opinion. Obviously, is a, I'm uh, I'm of part. I'm um, uh, I think that uh, the approach of design for design for all approach represents the interpretation, probably most uh, oriented to the conscious participation of the entire value chain in all phases of the development and use of products, services, and uh, environments and systems. Uh, so just in conclusion, uh, I take the, the definition of design for all, that is uh, design for human diversity, social inclusion and equality. It, it is from the Stockholm Declaration from 9 of May of 2004. And it is uh, the base of the activities of all, all uh, the the design for all community all over Europe and now we can say also all over the world. So the following is just the last, just to thank you and uh, I wait for any any kind of uh, or questions or issues about what I, I told.